All right, this morning I'm continuing, uh, after two, uh, two weeks break, uh, I'm continuing my sermon series, uh, apologetics sermon series uh, called Love Question. Okay, so this morning we have an interesting topic, a uh, very contentious topic. Uh, that's why I need to pray before we start, all right? So this morning's topic is how can Christianity be the only way to salvation? Okay, very contentious, right? Okay, so uh, when you come to this message with a heart of humility. All right, so when, uh, when you're sharing Christ or talking to people about Christianity, right, uh, one of the most common remarks that they will say to you is this. Uh, they will say this, uh, all religion is the same. They all teach us to be good. Correct? Uh? Do you all hear that? All religion is the same. Uh, they all teach you to be good. So if somebody says that to you, what will be your response? Yeah, true, uh, true. I agree with you, right? Correct? Uh? What would be your response? Usually you agree, right? All right, so uh, that's the topic that we're going to talk about uh, this morning. Uh, but before I begin, uh, I, I need to do a disclaimer uh, because we are a multi-religious country and religious harmony is very important. Okay, in our country, we respect that. Uh, so we are not here to put down any religion. We respect all religion. Uh, and if you have already found the right religion for yourself, right? Uh, you can choose not to listen to the rest of this message, all right? Uh, so this topic is for those who are open to uh, exploring different religion, exploring how Christianity is different uh, from other religion, and exploring whether Jesus' claim to be the only way to God, to salvation, is true, all right? So if you are open to that, you can continue to uh, listen on. All right, um, so after this uh, message, there will also be a Q&A. Okay, so if you have any questions uh, regarding our topic, uh, you can just type in, in the Slido uh, and send me the questions, all right? So just take a picture of this before I start. So Muhammad Gandhi uh, says this, my position is that all great religions are fundamentally equal. Okay, so... That's what Gandhi said. And uh, Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey uh, said this, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe there's only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to God. All right? Uh, yeah, sounds, sounds correct. And uh, uh, this guy, uh, you probably don't know him, uh, Michael Franti, he's a, actually a, a singer, songwriter. Okay? Uh, he says... Uh, this quote, God is too big for just one religion. So with all these quotes, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of, they, they kind of sound right. They all seem to say the same thing. And um, uh, who are we to impose our religious view, our religious preference on someone else, right? Uh, and actually, religion cannot be proved without reasonable doubt. So to say that one religion is better or correct, opposed to other religion is really highly offensive, uh, quite absurd, and uh, honestly arrogant. All right? So that is the, the line of argument. Uh, that's why a lot of uh, people are turning to New Age spirituality, because in New Age, uh, it basically talks about all religions having the some measure of truth, and all religion leads to the same God. All right? And uh, sometimes when you travel around the world, you see, wow, you know, India filled with, uh, you know, uh, Hindus, or you go to Thailand filled with Buddhists. Uh, so you'll be thinking, like, how can it be that all these people are going to be, to be lost because they don't know Jesus Christ? It doesn't make sense. Okay, so um, we struggle, you know, with this whole idea that there is only one truth, one God, uh, one pathway. And our most favorite uh, actress, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, says this, religion is the cause of all the problems in the world. I don't believe in organized religion at all. It's what separates people. One religion just represents fragments. It causes war. More people have died because of religious conflict than any other reason. All right, so uh, this, this whole idea that religion causes a lot of conflict, um, kind of resonate, you know, uh, we hear a lot of religious wars, and uh, we, we also try to say, okay, 
uh, since war is the cause of conflict, uh, division, let's just keep our religious views to ourselves. Keep it private. And uh, don't bring it out in the public. Uh, don't use it as an excuse for conflict. And don't share your faith, okay? Sharing your faith is the worst thing that you can ever do because evangelism is the now, is the new bad word. Okay, if you share your faith, means well, you really think you're smarter than everybody. It's highly, highly offensive. So with all these worldviews, uh, you know, uh, Hanging around on the internet, who is most affected? Of course, the next generation, you know, the younger ones. Uh, there might be people here in this audience actually believe all these statements that I'm going to say, uh, that I've just quoted. They actually believe it. Uh, they think it's correct. So it, it, what happens is that uh, as we're exposed to all this worldview, there are two things that will arise. The first worldview is called the rise of religious pluralism. Okay, have you heard of this word, religious pluralism? Plur religious pluralism. What does religious pluralism mean? Uh, it, it says that all religions are equally valid and true. Okay, sounds good, right? All religions are equally valid and true. Uh, the other uh, aspect of religious pluralism is what I call atheism. Atheism means all religions are equally false. So both are religious pluralism, uh, basically to say that you, know, can, you can believe whatever you want. Uh, and since it's so contentious, actually many people have moved away from religion, especially in the Western nations, the developed countries, uh, people are moving away. So they are more what I call nuns. Nuns mean people with no religion, all right? So that's what's happening uh, in the developed West. Uh, the other thing that rises because of all this uh, ideology that's floating around is the rise of secularism. Okay, secularism means even if you have a religion, you're supposed to keep it private. Don't bring it out in the public space. Don't talk about it. Uh, in politics, don't talk about it over coffee. Keep it to yourself. Uh, and um, if you share or try to share your faith, it is a big taboo. Okay? So as we look at all these statements, it, it, it really sounds very reasonable and uh, we kind of agree with them and uh, it makes sense. Uh. Okay, but uh, today as we look at these statements, we want to really evaluate whether, you know, does it make sense? Is it really true? Uh, we want to look at it critically. So I'm going to look at uh, false, some falsehoods in some of these statements. I'm going to look at eight uh, this morning. All right. So the first one is uh, religious pluralism. Okay. The first falsehood statement: all religions are equally valid and true. Okay. So the secular secularists will say, yeah, all religions are true. All religions are valid, okay, and, um, uh, but what are they actually doing? Uh? So if you ask any major religion, right, uh, you ask them, hey, is it this statement you agree? Or, or you ask a Buddhist, uh, you know, a priest or a Catholic or a Muslim uh, leader, you ask them, hey, is this statement, do you agree with this statement? What do you think they'll say? No lah. Okay. Most major religions would not agree with these statements. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you look at the population of the world, actually 97, no, 93% of the world is actually religious. Okay. Only 7% of the world are irreligious. Okay. So it's 7% of the people imposing their views on 93% of the world. Okay. So that's what's happening. Uh, everybody must accept this. If they don't accept this, they are considered bigots, intolerant. Okay? So by imposing this view on everybody else, the 90, 93%, who is the most not inclusive? Okay? Who is the most intolerant? Okay? So it's something you have to, you have to uh, decide for yourself. Even in Singapore, 22% are irreligious. Okay? So this uh, view represents irreligious view. Does it mean they should impose this view on uh, the other 78%? Okay, okay so uh, a Muslim uh, leader would be horrified if they were to hear that they have the same God as a Hindu. Okay, they would be horrified. Okay, so most religions would not agree that they are the same. Uh, so let's quickly look at this, uh, this table of religions. Okay, can you all see? Okay, so uh, for Buddhists, there's technically no God. 
Okay, they don't believe in any gods. Okay, they just believe in the law of karma. Uh, Christianity, of course, there are uh, three trinity. Hindu, there are many gods. Pantheism, everything is God. Okay, Islam, there's only one God. So, so to say that uh, their gods are all the same is actually very, very offensive to every major religion. Okay, it's, uh, it's blasphemy. And if you look at the, the way that they practice, uh, what are some of the practices? Of course, if you look at Buddhism, they have what I call the Eightfold Path, right? They have to cease all uh, earthly desires by having the right word, right speech, you know, uh, right kind of desires. Okay? And for Christianity, of course, we all know uh, we have different practices like baptism, communion. For the Hindus, they are supposed to uh, worship their gods through rituals and uh, different festivals. And for Islam, there's what we call the five pillars of faith that they're supposed to abide uh, by. And for Judaism, it's basically the uh, Ten Commandments and obeying the laws uh, in the Old Covenant. All right? So if you look at this, uh, you will say, no, la, all religions are not the same. In fact, they contradict one another. So it's not possible that they are all equally valid okay, if they contradict one another. Uh, what else do we see? Uh, we see they have different life purpose. So for example, in Buddhism, they're supposed to purge all earthly desires while ent- attaining merit. Okay, for Christians, it's to love God and to love people. Uh, for Hindus, it's to uh, basically achieve good karma okay, uh, so that you can go to the next world. And for Islam, it's to live according to the five pillars. And for Judaism, it's to worship God and to obey the laws. So once again, you see the life purpose is actually very, very different. Uh, and for Buddhists, how do they uh, be safe? Basically, they reach, achieve nirvana, which is a state of nothingness where they escape the cycle of suffering uh, by following and seizing earthly desires through the eightfold paths. Okay? For Christianity, we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And for Hinduism, basically, they are supposed to uh, worship the gods and pursue enlightenment uh, in an attempt to reincarnate. Okay? Uh, and for, for Islam, of course, they are supposed to submit to God uh, in all their ways so that they, uh, through the five, four, uh, five pillars, so that they can uh, achieve salvation. And for Judaism, uh, it's, it's the same. They have to abide by different laws okay, to uh, escape hell and achieve salvation. So you, if, as you look at all these uh, different religions, the afterlife and the pathway to salvation, you'll realize that every religion has a different way to reach salvation. Every religion has a different life purpose. So to say that they are all equally valid, even though many of their paths, pathway to salvation, contradict one another, is basically to disrespect every single religion. All right, so um, as we look at this, we realize um, either it's like a statement, you know, um, I am a married bachelor. Do you understand? I'm a married bachelor. Does it make sense? Either you're a bachelor or you're married. It cannot be both. uh. Uh, My wife is semi pregnant. God forbid, but my wife is semi pregnant. No, that's not something. Either either she's pregnant or not pregnant. Okay, so many of these truths are contradicting, uh, they contradict one another. So there's no way uh, it can be true. So, for example, Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Muslims don't believe that Jesus uh, uh, rose from the dead. He was taken up to heaven. He uh, he didn't die. Uh, Jews uh, believe that. Jesus just died and remained dead. Remain dead. So everyone has different uh, claims about who Jesus is. So they cannot be all correct. Okay? So this is the first falsehood they are all, that all religions are equally valid and equally true. Uh, most religions will not agree with that. Second falsehood, only Christianity is exclusive. Okay, so we are often being targeted because we are the most vocal. Uh, we are clear about our position. Okay, but if you look at it, and if you ask every religion, 
uh, whether they believe that their religion is the only way. If you talk to them, they will definitely tell you that it's the only way. Okay, because if, if they don't say it's the only way that the pathway is correct, then their religion ceases to exist. There's no purpose. You can just choose whatever you want. Okay, so every religion in itself is exclusive, whether you like it or not. And the irony is, even if you are a secularist or a religious pluralist, you are also exclusive. You know why? Because you are telling everybody, the 93% uh, of the world, that they must hold to your statement, which is all religions are true. See? You are forcing 93% of the world to agree with you. All religions are true. And if you are atheist, you are also exclusive because you are telling the whole world all religions are false and you must agree with me. Okay? So in trying to be inclusive, uh, they are actually not inclusive, they are actually intolerant, uh, just like the rest of the world. So if Christianity is arrogant, so is every other view. All right? So it's not true that only Christianity is exclusive. Uh, religion causes the most division and wars. That's the third, third falsehood. Okay, but uh, the truth of the matter is any differences in opinion will cause division. Okay, whether it's race, whether you believe in vaccine or no vaccine, it causes division. Whether you're a polit you Democrat or Republican, it causes division. Okay, uh, some believe in aliens, some don't. Okay? So <laughs> any kind of views will cause a division. Okay, the key is respectful dialogue, not uh, uniformity in views because we are not uh, uniform robots. Huh? So they did a, a pew in USA on what is the top reason for conflict. So the first top reason, 55%, why there's conflict in the US, first is between immigrants and people who are born in the US. Second reason, uh, between the rich and the poor. Third reason, uh, between the black and the whites. Fourth reason, young and old. Uh, and religion is not even not part of the top few reasons. And does religion cause the most wars? Uh, there's this book called The Encyclopedia of Wars. Okay, so it records all the wars throughout human history. There's all together 1,763 wars. Uh, and they found that only 121 wars were started primarily because of religious reason. Okay, that's 6.9%. Okay, so it's not true that wars are started by religion. So Gwyneth Paltrow needs to get her facts right. Okay, so whatever you read on the internet, uh, don't just believe wholesale. Eh? So there's this guy, uh, his name is Jasper Ford. He's an English novelist and he said it correctly. He said, religion isn't the cause of wars, it is the excuse for many wars. Okay, so you look at a lot of uh, terrorist groups, uh, ISIS, JI, or even uh, white supremacists, they will use the context of war uh, religion to start wars. But the true nature of war is the sinful nature of every man because of greed for power. That's why wars are started. Okay, the fourth falsehood is that religion is uh, culturally relative and therefore not objectively true. So they will say if you're born in India, you will be a Hindu. If you're born in Thailand, you will be a Buddhist. If you're born in Israel, you will be a Jew. Okay, so in the same way, if you are born in the Western developed nations, you will become a religious pluralist, okay? which means a religious pluralist view is also not objective. Okay, so um, uh, this, this sounds very correct, uh, but in every of these countries, people come to faith, come to Christianity uh, on their own. So it, it doesn't mean that majority of people believe in that, you must believe in that. There was once upon a time where the majority of the people believe in slavery. Does it make slavery correct? No. Uh, in fact, uh, countries like China, uh, China used to be anti-God, but in the last few decades, the, the highest uh, rising religion uh, growth is actually Christianity. Same with Africa. Okay, the highest growing religion is Christianity. Uh, if you look at Korea as well, Korea used to be a Confucius country. Okay, last few decades, uh, in the 90s, they have reached 27% Christians. Okay? So it's not true that because you're born in a certain place, you will definitely be something, uh, a certain religion, and you can't change. That's not true. 
It's not culturally relative. In fact, Christianity is from the Middle East, okay, but it's the West who have adopted it uh, a lot more at the beginning. First, quote number five is, God should accept all religion. It says, if God is a loving and personal God, why should we care how uh, we approach Him? He should accept us just as the way we are, no matter what our beliefs are. So do you know that uh, in this world, there are roughly about uh, 10,000 religions, okay, including cults, huh? 10,000. So then the question is, uh, should God also accept those religions whose leaders believe in free sex? Okay, you watch a lot of that, right? Free sex, what else? Uh, relig- or cults that uh, actually tell their members to die by suicide. Do we also accept those uh, religions? How about um, fascism? Fascism is actually a political religion. Uh, should God also accept Hitler? just as he accepted Mother Teresa. Is that correct? Is that fair? All right, so, so um, God is a personal God. It means to accept um, or, or to love God, you need to know who God is and must know something about who God is uh, in order to love that personal God. So you cannot just love anything uh, about this person without knowing anything about this person. So, for example, uh, in order to, to know me and to love me, you must know something about me. You know, you cannot uh, just, oh, Alvin, yeah, I know him. He likes to crochet and he can play the guitar. That's not true. I can't do either of that. All right, so uh, we need to know something about a person in order to love the person. So uh, some, sometimes when, um, uh, when I, I visit my old church, you know, uh, a great assembly, sometimes I go back, and uh, different people will come to me and then you know, strike a conversation. Then I'll, I can't know whether they know me or not. Some of them think, still think, hey, oh, you're still in grace, huh? How are you? Uh? So you know, oh, this person really don't know. Then there are some people who come to me and then they try to strike a conversation and then they start saying, oh, which senior pastor are you working under now? Oh, then I also know, okay, so they don't really know anything about me. Lah. And then there are those who come to me and say, oh, yeah, you, you are uh, serving as senior pastor in Maranatha Christian Assembly. Oh? Wow. Those people I know are serious to have a relationship with me because they know my, I already left for three years, you know. So these people know something about me and have a relationship with me. So in order to have a relationship with God, it's important to know some things uh, about God. Okay? And um, uh, Timothy Keller says this, if Christians are right about Jesus being God, the Muslims and the Jews fail in a serious way to love God as God really is. But if Muslims and Jews are right that Jesus is not God, but rather a teacher or prophet, then Christians fail in a serious way to love God as God really is. So we need to love the right God with the right knowledge about who this God is. We cannot just love a God that we get all our facts right and expect God to accept us. Okay, Uh, that, that, that cannot be. God cannot accept us when we know Him and love Him for who He is. Okay, so we cannot accept 10,000 uh, religions uh, and, and assume that they all lead to God. Six falsehood. Six falsehood is that uh, is, is the view of secularism. Religious views should be kept private. Okay, please don't talk. Don't bring your religious values and your views. Keep it within your own house. But actually, it's quite difficult to do that. Okay, like I mentioned, even in Singapore, 78% of people have a religion and 90, 93% uh, of the world have a religion. It's impossible to keep your own religious values in the public square. Okay, so let's take for example. Let's say you are a, uh, a politician or you are somebody who is voting for a politician. Okay, so... Uh, Let's say this politician believes in abortion laws, for example. You know, abortion laws. So, should ab- abortion be pro-life or pro-choice? Should we allow or don't allow? Okay? Surely your religious views have to come uh, into the public square. Okay? Because you present a certain view. And, and how late should a, a, a fetus be allowed to be aborted? Well, this pertains to your religious views, isn't it? Your values. Uh, how about marriage? 
Should we make divorce easier or more difficult? Depends whether you believe marriage should be a permanent thing or not, correct? Uh, how about should marriage be allowed between people of same gender? Well, it depends on your values, and your values are determined by your religion. It is dependent on your values, secular or religious. How about um, a decision on uh, death penalty? Okay, should, should uh, somebody who traffic in drugs be given a death penalty? Well, it depends on how you view the san sanctity of life. How about uh, laws on the walls? If a country invades Singapore, are we allowed to invade the other country? Well, it depends on your views on laws. So it's impossible actually to keep your values, your, your views, uh, they are influenced by religious values out of the public square. It is impossible. Uh, it has to influence how you make policies. It has to influence how you live as a person, even in the workplace. If you see something that is not done right, will you speak up or will you not? Well, it depends on your values, and your values are dependent on your religious views okay? and, or, or your secular views. You have to say something if you feel that it is wrong. Okay, so there's no way that you can be completely neutral and be completely secular. What does it mean to be completely secular? Nobody knows. Okay, so we all bring our own views, whether we like it or not, into the public square. And we, we should be allowed to voice our views on gambling, uh, our views on uh, abortion and different things because we are a multi-religious society. Okay, uh, and... and a lot of people say we should separate church from state. Have you heard this? Church from state. Yeah, it's true. We should separate church from state. But what does this sentence actually mean? It means that no monopoly of a certain religious views on the other views. That's what it means. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have any religious views. It means that no one single view, a religious view, should dominate politics. Okay, so that's what it means. What is the seven uh, uh, eight? Okay, the seven falsehood. It is wrong to persuade someone to change his or her religion. Okay, so the, it, this one, this one really affect us, uh, because as Christian we are called to evangelize, right? Okay, so this one affects us. Uh, and uh, uh, evangelism is a new bad word. Remember, okay. But if you think about it. If somebody were to come to me uh, and start to share their religious faith to me and try to convert me to another religion, right? How, how, will, how will you think I feel? Uh? I will feel very honoured uh, that this person cares uh, and is willing to engage with me regarding his religious views. I'll, I'll feel very honoured. I'll feel that hey, this person respects my views. That's why he wants to be willing to engage in a dialogue with me. Okay, uh, and, and this person is not just indifferent or don't care whether I'm going to hell or, or to heaven because this person has a view that he wants to share with me. I would feel very honoured and would love to engage with them. So to truly respect somebody and their views is to respectfully engage them. Not forcing your own views, but to respectfully engage them and have a meaningful dialogue. So people who are offended or think that it's wrong, they, it's okay, you just keep your own view, but there's nothing wrong with sharing with somebody who is willing to engage you uh, in this area. Okay? In fact, it's very respectful to hear their views and to learn about their religion. Uh, I, I do that as I, as, I, as I talk to different people. I hear what their religion is, is first and foremost, before I engage and talk about my own. All right? So it, it, there's nothing wrong. In fact, it is more respectful and loving to engage them than to ignore them. Okay, the last one, the last falsehood uh, I want to dispel is the, the, the falsehood that all religion hold part of the truth. So there is a very famous uh, illustration that people will always share about. It's about six blind men. Okay, have you heard of six blind men? Six blind men uh, goes into a room and each of the blind men touches a different part of the animal. 
So the first one, oh, he was touching the, the ears, and then the blind man said, oh, it is a fan. Second person touched the, 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 the tusk and said, oh, this is a spear. The last one touched the trunk, uh, no, last third one touched the trunk and said, oh, this feels like a snake. The fourth one touched uh, the, 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 the legs and said, oh, it's a tree trunk. Uh, the fifth one touched the side of the elephant and he said, oh, it's a wall. And the last one touches the tail and say, it is a rope. So this illustration is always used to talk about every religion, whole part of the truth. Okay? So they are all correct because they hold part of the truth. All well, this argument sounds very good and very logical and sounds very inclusive, sounds very tolerant, sounds very humble approach uh, to, to the whole topic of religion. But if you look at it, uh, are the six blind men correct or wrong? Are they correct? Wrong lah. Okay? It's only correct if they are all blind. <laughs> Including me lah, I'm blind also. It's only correct if you are all blind. Means it's only correct if the blind is leading the blind. It's not correct if one person can see. Okay? Then it's wrong. It's not all of this, it is an elephant. <laughs> okay? So, uh, no matter how much you believe it is, it is the truth, if it's not the truth, means it's not the truth. Okay, one plus one equals two. No matter how much you believe it's not two, it's still two. No matter whether you believe in gravity or don't believe in gravity, you try jumping out from the fourth floor, you will break a leg. Ah. Okay, so, so uh, whether we believe or not uh, has nothing to do with it. If it's the truth, it's the truth. All right? Um, So then you ask, okay, uh, who is the one seeing? Who can see? That's a very important question, right? Everybody blind, who can see? Are you sure you can see or not? What makes you think you can see? See? So that's, that's the big question. And uh, there are 10,000 re religions out there. How do you know yours is correct? Okay, sounds very reasonable. You know, uh, which, one is, which one is the most reason reasonable and which one is not blind faith? Uh, so Socrates uh, says, an ex unexamined life is not worth living. So a lot of people give up because there's 10,000 religions, they don't know which one is correct. Then they say, heck it lah, let me just go and live whatever I like. Okay, let me do whatever I like, I don't care. Too complicated for my brain, you know, let me just live my own life. But Socrates uh, says that unexamined life is not worth living, which means we have to make an attempt to understand, examine, look at different uh, major religions and ask, hey, actually, which one makes the most sense? Which one is the most credible? We have to do that because you cannot live your life of 70 years. After that, you die, you meet God. Then God asks you, hey, how come, how come you're here? I don't know. Uh, I've got no time to think about religion. I, I give 70 years, not enough. Ah? No, lah, God, not enough. Okay, so, so we have to uh, ask and look at the different claims and make, make up our minds on what is the most Credible, most reasonable. Uh, so, in my last sermons, I talk about there's an intelligent creator okay, there, uh, in the world out there. Through science, we can see that there is an intelligent maker. So, we establish that God exists. Okay, we didn't come out from random evolution. Does it make sense? There's an intelligent maker. So, we have already established that. We have established that uh, Religious pluralism doesn't make sense because religion contradict one another. So the third step is, with all these religions, how are we going to know which one is correct? Okay, how are we going to know? So the big idea for us is that Jesus Christ is God's unique and credible salvation initiative. Jesus Christ is God's unique and credible salvation initiative. Okay, so when I say salvation, it doesn't just mean a pie in the sky where you go after you die. Okay, salvation means how do I live a life of purpose and meaning according to how God intended for us to live on planet Earth can okay, eventually go back to Him. Okay, that's what salvation means. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we decide? So today, uh, I'm going to share with you five unique differences uh, between Christianity and all other religions, okay, all the, all the 
and 99,000 uh, religions out there, there are five distinct qualities of Christianity that is radically different from all other religions, and it can give us a sense of maybe Christianity is different, maybe Christianity is more credible. We're going to look at one single passage, uh, so you can use that to share with your friends. Uh, you can share with your friend this passage, you can share with your friends these five unique differences. Okay? So reading from John chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, I will take you to myself, and where I am, you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. All right, so the first difference Christianity with all other religions uh, is simply this, do versus done. So in all other religions, if you look at their framework, it's basically faith plus works. You need to do, not just believe, you need to do enough good deeds so that your good deeds can outweigh your bad deeds. You must follow a certain way. If you do it enough, you will be safe. Okay? Uh, but do you ever know that it will be enough? You never know because it may be not enough. Okay, so it leads to a lot of worries and insecurity and absence of peace uh, in your heart because you don't really know whether God is really pleased, whether it's enough for God to save you. You don't really know. But in John 14 verse 1, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So Christianity is the only religion that is not based on how much we can do, our good works, uh, our merits to save ourselves. It is based entirely on what Christ has done on the cross. Okay, do versus done. What He has done on the cross, not how much you can do to save yourself. If you can do a certain amount of good deeds to save yourself, technically, Jesus doesn't need to come and die for you. You can just do enough good deeds to save yourself. Okay, so uh, it is a radical um, uh, 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 theology, it's a radical uh, message, good news because it's based on belief. Whether you believe Jesus is the Son of God, whether you believe He came to earth, whether you believe He died on a cross for you, and all you have to do is to say, thank you, I am a sinner, I receive you, I turn from following myself to following you. I receive by grace through faith. It is a radical message uh, that no religion ever propagates. It is based on what God has done. It is the good news. It is the gospel. So it is unique to Christianity. It answers the cry of every human heart for forgiveness and eternal security. Do versus done. It removes the fear of death. It removes the fear of uncertainty in the afterlife. Second difference, Christianity versus all other religion is rules versus relationship. In all religions, it always focus on certain rules, certain rituals, certain festivals that you have to do okay, in order to be safe. So in all religions, it focus on a transcendent God who is high above the human race. They have to obey, they have to fear uh, the transcendent God uh, so that that transcendent God doesn't bring down punishment uh, doesn't br uh, bring down uh, uh, condemnation. So they have to fearfully obey the transcendent God. In Christianity, we have a transcendent God, but at the same time, we have an imminent God, the God who is not just far above the heaven, a God who came near, a, a God who uh, came down to our level, a God who wants to be close to us, a God who wants to have a relationship with His creation, 
So this highly radical, uh, 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 the language here found in this text, it talks about Jesus Christ preparing a room in the Father's house so that we can be received into the Father's house. He calls us His children and He wants to have a relationship uh, with us as His children. So the priority of the Christian message is not so much the rules and the rituals, but the priority is to have a relationship with His creation. Rules and rituals is an outflow of that relationship with God the Father. This is radical because why would God, who has everything, wants to be good friends and have a relationship with the creation? So this is highly radical and, and no other religion does that. It meets our primary deep-seated need to have a relationship that lasts forever. Uh, and, and that is provided uh, through the God of Christianity. Third difference, search versus sent. Why are there 10,000 religions uh, in the world? Do you know why? Because it is wired in man's heart to search for God. Just wired. Uh, the search for eternity, the search for something bigger than ourselves. It's just hardwired in us. We, are, we will find 101 ways okay, to, to, to seek after God uh, and to reach God in every decade. Okay? Religions will never be wiped out. Even though we are in a postmodern world, people are still looking for God. And uh, I was shocked uh, you know, that Singapore also got cult. Do you all know Singapore got cult or not? You all don't know, right? Okay, I also don't know. I thought only Netflix got cult. Recently, I read in the papers, uh, there's this cow, uh, this woman, uh, quite, quite good. Uh, she, she got 30 followers, uh, okay? Uh, uh, she's in her 50s. Uh. So, uh, she actually uh, conned some of these 30 women, uh, uh, people to, to sell their house, you know, and give her the money, and even buy a house for her to stay, you know. Uh, so, they, they, they say, oh, you're you are going to donate to this, uh, this group in India, but she take all their money, you know, uh, and, and she kept it. Uh. Okay, this, this cult. Uh, and, and the followers actually listen to her, you know, to the point that if they don't obey, you know what, what does she do? She make them eat feces, oh. then make them pull out the teeth. Oh. And then got one lady even asked her to jump from second floor down, then broke her ankles. But they still do. Oh. Wow. Amazing, right? Quite powerful, right? Uh, so I'm shocked. Whoa, see, you, people will find 101 ways, uh, to search for God, uh, even when it's so blatantly wrong, even in Singapore, uh, in today's context. So, so the key is that people are finding 101 ways to reach God, to find healing, to find uh, salvation. Imagine you are God, uh, okay? Imagine you are God. Just, just put yourself as God now, uh, okay? And if you have a solution, right, to this salvation thing, would you create 10,000 ways? Would you or not? Oh, let's create 10,000 ways so that I can confuse the people. Just choose. Got 10,000, just choose anyone. W will you do that if you're God? A lot of people think that God should do that, but I mean, if you're God, are you going to do that? No lah. Do, do you need 10,000 ways? You only need what? One way lah. Less confusion, right? Just, just do this. One way. Easy. But people don't want the one way leh. They want the 10,000 way leh. How come ah? Imagine your God, will you be angry? Huh? Angry or not? Angry lah. I give you one way, you keep choosing the 10,000 ways. Then jump down some more, then break a bone, but still one. Okay? So, so God has created one way, and, and uh, God has sent His Son. People are searching, but God has sent His Son. It's God's initiative. He has sent His Son. Okay? And, and everybody also can say they are sent, right? Oh, I'm sent from God. I have a message from God. But this sending is different because if you look at uh, the life of Jesus Christ, actually Jesus fulfilled more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament. Uh, I'm just listing you a few. Uh. Okay, how he was born, Bethlehem, born a virgin, how he, he died, the kind of death he is, he suffered, how he's ascended. So all these are the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, I've just listed a few. And, and, and for somebody to just fulfill 16 of them, uh, 16, uh, the probability uh, is 1 uh, in 10 to the power of 45. Just one person fulfilled 16 of this. But, but Jesus fulfilled 300. So, 
He already tell you he sent, but we refuse. We want to search for our own way. Okay, God fulfilled, uh, Jesus fulfilled all this prophecy and, 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 and in this passage, what did he say? He said what? He said, when I come again. How do you know he sent? He said, when I come again. Means what? Do, do you all ever say, uh, when I come again? No, no, right? Human being, when I come again. No, 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 we don't say that. Come again means what? The first time somebody must send you, you must have come from somewhere. So when Jesus said, when I come again, means he's from somewhere. And where is, where is he from? He's from heaven. He, he's with God. That's why he come, he was sent. And he will come again. How do you know he come again? Because the first time he come, the prophecy is true. The second time he come, there are prophecies again. You must listen to that message. He is sent. He is not because of own searching. He will come again. He is sent by God. Don't invent your own way. Follow the one way that He created. So G- Jesus Christ meets our need for salvation, our search for salvation. So the good news is you can stop searching. Don't, don't, don't find new ways. Don't invent new cults. We have enough of them. There's already one way. Just follow the same way. All right? Simple. Uh, satisfy our search. Stop searching because God is the answer. Fourth difference is taught versus caught. Taught versus caught. All religious founders will tell you, hey, this is the way to salvation. Just follow this way. Okay? Uh, I will teach you how to do it. Uh, I'll teach you what to do. Then you will be able to reach salvation. Just follow my teaching. Okay? Every religious founder will say that. They will produce a book. But if you look at their life, okay, no religious founder is able to match up the teachings. He can tell you, but just don't look at my life. You know, my life is not perfect. Don't, 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 don't. Just, just follow my teaching. Okay? Uh, don't look at my life. But for Jesus, it's different. Jesus had great teaching. Okay? Nobody can improve on the teaching of God. It is the foundation of modern civilization, modern laws. Nobody can improve and better the teaching of Jesus. But not only did Jesus taught, he tells what? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not just this is the way, the truth, and the life. No, no, no. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Which means Jesus himself embodied all this truth. Okay? Uh, it's not just a certain doctrines that you have to follow. He is. You need to come through him. You need to know him. You need to believe in him. He himself is the walking way. He himself is the walking truth. He himself is the walking life. So he says, I am the way. You need to come to the Father through me. He exemplifies it through a sinless life. None of the religious founders had a sinless life. If you look at their lives, you will find some things that are very questionable. But no sin was found in Jesus, even by Pilate, who is the one who had to send him uh, to the cross. And not only did, did he teach, uh, he, he told a paralytic guy, you know, your sins are forgiven. Then people say, hey, how come Jesus talked like that? Only God can forgive sins. Okay? Your sins are forgiven. So people wanted to stone him. But immediately after that, he healed the person of his crippled limbs. Means he affirmed that he is God through his teaching that he is the Son of God. Okay? He is the truth. And he backed it up with miracles uh, that he's speaking the truth. And he is the life. In this passage, what's amazing, he says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Means looking at Jesus and looking at his life is like seeing God. When you look at Jesus, you know what you're supposed to do in this life. Uh, he ate with sinners, tax collectors, he washed the feet of the disciples. Through his life, we catch who God is, the love of God uh, for, for humanity. We see that and we know what we're supposed to do. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody talks like that. He was the embodiment of God. Uh, so for us, we are always looking for a what? A celebrity. We're looking for a, a, an idol to follow. Uh, we're looking at influencers. We want to follow somebody. It's a very natural thing. We want to follow somebody. Uh, and, and people are so hooked onto how many followers we have. Okay? But God knows that desire to follow something. Someone who not just talk, but walks the talk. Jesus says, follow me. 
I'm the best example. I'm the best person, a best influencer that you can follow. And it, it satisfies our search for meaning, for purpose, for someone to follow. Jesus fulfilled that desire. We want to catch something from God's life. He's the only one who tells people, don't just follow my teaching, catch it from my lifestyle. So that is the fourth difference. The last difference and the most important difference is dead versus alive. Dead versus alive. There might be some religious founder who have a very righteous life. There might be some religious founder who, you know, teach very good things. Uh, there may be even some religious founder that can create miracles. Okay? But every single religious founder is dead. They tell you they have the keys to eternal life. They tell you they can save you by following a certain path. But they have never proven it with their own life. They have never overcome death to teach you how to overcome death. The only person who has ever done that is Jesus Christ. Even before he died, he said, you can destroy this temple, but in three days, I will raise it up. He proves that he has overcome death and is able to save us. So that is the litmus test. That is the litmus test of a true religious founder is whether the person can overcome that. And none of the religious founder dare to say that or have proven that out to be true. So this is a topic I'm going to talk about in my next sermon because this is the litmus test uh, for, for whether a religion is worth following. So let me uh, close with a quote by C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says this, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. This is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he is a poached egg, else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. What does it mean? It means if Jesus was not, is not the Lord of all, he would either be a liar or a lunatic. But if Jesus is neither a liar or a lunatic, it only has one conclusion. It means that Jesus is Lord. So you have to make a decision. Who is this Jesus Christ? Is he really different from all other religion uh, and, and we have this precious message which is called the gospel the good news which is so so very different from all other religion you know when we go uh, when we went to the philippines uh, you know one week ago uh, we made sure that we carried the message of the gospel because that was the whole point of going there so in every uh, you know elderly ministry grouping we had always take the first 10 minutes, 15 minutes to share with them the gospel. And even though they are from a Roman Catholic uh, nation, you know, when I ask, you know, how many, how many of you uh, tonight, if you die uh, tonight, how many of you are sure you are going to heaven? Usually, less than 10% would raise their hands. And then when I share the gospel, uh, at the end, usually 100% will stand up and say, thank you for the good news. I want to receive that good news. Uh, because there's a, there's a precious message that is so, so different that is given to us. And we need to bring that message to the ends of the world. And that's why Jesus came. He came for us, not just us, for those who do not know 
the gospel. Let us pray. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, I want to give thanks for the good news, O Lord, for the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who came to earth 2,000 years ago to die on a cross for our sins so that we are not saved because of our good deeds or how good we are, but because of what you have done on the cross for us. Father, we receive that good news and want to bring that good news to anyone who has not heard because you have given us one path, one way, not based on our initiative, but based on your initiative. You have sent your son to us to bring that message that there is hope, there is a way to God through you. Father, we give thanks for that message and help us to bring that gospel message to the ends of the world, that many more will come back to you. Many more will receive that good news, that path of salvation, because you are God who wants a relationship with us. We are so privileged and honoured that the God of the universe wants to have a relationship with us and we want to come back to you because you love us. Uh, we give thanks for uh, this sharing and um, everyone who's hearing, I pray you yourself will pursue them with this good news, O oh Lord. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, in summary, okay, uh, you can take a picture of this uh, when you want to share Christ. Uh, five things that are different, do versus done, rules versus relationship, search versus sent, thought versus caught, and lastly, dead versus alive. Okay? Something very simple, very easy uh, to share to anyone. Uh, who asks you what's so different about Christianity. All right? So if you want uh, more resources, uh, you can look at these three books, When Skeptic Us, Case for Christ, as well as Reasonable Faith. Okay, you want to explore more on this, uh, this whole topic. All right. Uh